Hi guys, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about various parasitics which are present just because our capacitor is off chip. We can broadly categorize these parasitics in three sources. So there are parasitics which are generated because of the chip package. Two popular choices of packages are QFN and CSP. Then there are parasitic generated by PCB routing or PCB vias. And finally there are parasitic associated with off chip capacitors itself. Here ESR stands for equivalent series resistance and ESL stands for equivalent series inductance. To better visualize it, let's draw a cartoon with QFN package. So in red here we have our die which is mounted on a lead frame and bonded to lead frame through the bond wires. In green we have PCB tracks which connects chips to the capacitor. Multilayer ceramic capacitor or MLCC capacitors are one of the most popular form of capacitors used in PCB design. The other terminal of capacitor is connected to the ground plane through PCB via. Hopefully this cartoon gives you a physical feel of what are the components which are involved. Now let's turn our attention to the modeling of this network. One wire is often modeled by an inductor in series with a resistor. PCB tracks and VIA are mostly inductive with a very small value of resistance. ESR is obviously a resistance and ESL is an inductance. So most of these parasitic are inductive in nature with small amount of resistance in series. There is some capacitance of the PCB track but it is negligible as compared to the big capacitor over here. So let's build a lump model of these parasitic. So bond wire is modeled here. This is the PCB and this is the off chip capacitor. Notice that we haven't modeled the ground return path here. And this is because I'm modeling the whole loop inductance here. Now calculating inductance is a tricky business. One very useful rule of thumb is that each millimeter track has an inductance of one nano Henry. And this is true for both bond wires and PCB tracks. Both bond wires and PCB tracks are few millimeter long. So both these inductances can be few nano Henry's. Bond wire resistance is of the order of few tens of milliohms. PCB track resistance is of the order of few milliohms. ESR can range from few milliohms to hundreds of milliohms. And ESL can range from hundreds of pico Henry to few nano Henry's. Best way to find out the ESR and ESL is to consult the capacitor data sheet. Some vendors even provide the SPICE model for the capacitor. Best way to model the PCB track is to get the S parameter of the PCB track extracted. Lump model is often a good enough approximation for the bond wires. If you have more than one bond wire, then take the mutual inductance into the account as well. One final effect to consider is the derating and temperature effect in the capacitor value itself. Derating refers to the change in capacitor's value with the change in voltage across it. You can find these values in the capacitor data sheet. Okay, which of these three is dominant effect? Well, it depends on the package type, the PCB design and the capacitor used. For example, if you use CSP package rather than QFN package, then CSP package doesn't have any bond wires. CSP package uses balls to connect to the PCB. An inductance of a ball is typically tens to hundreds of pico Henry. So in that case, you can practically ignore this component of the parasitic. On the other hand, if you use good quality capacitors or multiple capacitors in parallel, the effect of ESR and ESL is pretty much reduced. Similarly, how you design your PCB track can make this component the dominant factor or you can ignore it. Okay, having considered the model, now let's turn our attention to the effect of this parasitic on LDO performance. To simplify our analysis, we will combine all the inductance into the one inductor component and all the resistances into one resistor component. To complete our model, we need to add another component here and that is on-chip capacitor. This on-chip capacitor will itself has some ESR and ESL but we will ignore it for our analysis. Also, we will assume that this capacitor is of the order of tens of picofarad. One obvious effect of adding all this parasitic is to increase the order of the loop. We are replacing a first order capacitor with a third order RLC network. Let's try to find the magnitude response of this parasitic network when looking from the side of LDU. 
the low frequency response will be dominated by this big capacitor here. So we'll see minus 20 dB roll off at low frequencies. At certain higher frequencies, we will hit the zero because of this resistance. The zero will cause the magnitude response to flatten out. At still higher frequencies, we will hit another zero because of this inductance. And this zero will cause the magnitude response to rise. In fact, depending on the value of inductance and resistances, these two discrete zero might be a complex zero as well. At further higher frequencies, we will eventually hit a complex pole because of this L and C network here. After hitting this complex pole, the magnitude will start to fall again with minus 20 dB per decade slope. So what are we plotting here? We are plotting the impedance of the network looking from the LDO. So we can see that effect of this extra parasitic is to increase the impedance after a certain frequency. This increase in impedance has implication for the stability as well as for transient response. So let's consider stability first. All these extra poles and zeros are on the left hand side plane. And this is because we have a purely passive network here. So it has to be on left hand side. Now left hand side zeros are in general good for your stability. So you will find that after adding these extra components, your stability or phase margins has in fact improved. Which is a good thing, right? In general, yes, except for this peaking over here. Let's superimpose LDO's loop gain over this plot. So we start with a high gain, then hit the first pole, and the gain starts to roll off. Then we hit this zero, but for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that the second pole of the LDO also occurs the same frequency. So the second pole and this zero will cancel out each other, and amplitude will continue to roll off. Then we hit this zero, and amplitude response flattens out. And finally we hit this double pole and amplitude starts to roll off again. Okay, so what is the problem with this magnitude plot? The problem is that this flattening happens very close to the unity gain frequency. And because of this double pole here, it can really kill your gain margin. Another problem is that we have a complex pole here, which has a large magnitude peaking associated with it. And if you're not careful, this peaking can cross the 0 dB line. Okay, so how to solve this problem? There are a couple of options. One is to add additional pole in the loop at this frequency range. This will cause the roll-off faster, and this peak will not cause the 0 dB line. But better way to solve is to use a large enough capacitor here, so that all this phenomena happens much below the 0 dB line. You want to make sure that including all the variation in these parasitics, this peaking remains at least 10 to 15 dB below the 0 dB line. Okay, let's consider the effect on transient response. For that, let's plot the impedance at the output of LDO. LDO will have low impedance because of the high loop gain and the large capacitors till it hits the unity gain frequency. After hitting the unity gain frequency, it will simply follow the blue curve, which is the kind of open loop impedance. So we see that there is a frequency band where the impedance stops to fall. In fact, it rises and it takes some higher frequency to make it fall again. What it means is that there will be a range of frequencies where LDO load response will not be good. Intuitively speaking, at low frequency, the transient response will be determined by the LDO gain and the off-chip capacitor. And it will be a good transient response. Then in certain middle band, the high impedance of inductor will cut off the capacitor from the LDO. And that will be the band when transient response will not be good. And then at even higher frequencies, this capacitor comes into the picture and transient response again becomes good. Okay, so how to solve this problem? In fact, there is no easy answer to that. You need to spend your time to make sure that you minimize these parasitics. You use a good quality capacitor and spend area to increase the on-chip capacitor. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. And that also concludes the LDO with off-chip capacitors. In next video, we will look at fully on-chip LDOs. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.